You know, the second you say yes to Jesus is the very second that your foot places uh, itself on the battlefield and it's game on. And many believers don't even understand this reality and they have to find out the hard way. But the enemy is real and the fight is real. And if you don't learn how to fight, then you're going to get your tail spiritually handed to you. And I don't know about you, but once you've been in the fight long enough and you have seen the, the destruction that the enemy can bring, it should make you mad to no end and it should cause you to well up with such a holy anger that you want to do everything within your power to resist him and see the victory of Almighty God come over your life and fulfill your calling. Today, we're going to move into the second part of the series that we're calling Overcoming the Enemy. If you're going to live for God, you're going to have to learn how to overcome the enemy as you defend your faith. We shared this last week, and I will share it again. It says this, when you step out into faith, and that can be anything from stepping out in, in your uh, salvation and saying yes to Jesus, inviting Christ to be at the center of your life and living in your heart. It can be going public with your faith through water baptism. It can be um, testing God and trying him in the tithe. It can be sharing your faith. It can be so many things. In essence, what we're talking about is anything that you do that pleases God, that is an act of obedience to God and surrender to God, the enemy is going to come after you. He's going to attack you in an effort to get you to give up prematurely to prevent you from acquiring the promises God has for you. And before you can accomplish the good things that he planned for you years before you were ever born. Here's the reality. The more you step out in the faith, the more you succeed in enduring in this battle and, and finishing strong and finishing out the things that God has called you to do, the stronger you become and the more unstoppable you become and the more and more and more of a threat you become to the kingdom of the darkness. You see, you may not understand this today, but you need to understand it, that as a believer, when you are sealed in Christ, you immediately become a threat to the kingdom of darkness. The enemy doesn't want you to know this, but you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Now, if you just live your life and you just live an idle Christian life and you just slide by, you're really not much of a threat. But the more you step out and you pursue your purpose and your calling, the things that God called you to be and the things that God called you to do many, many, many years ago before you ever enter your mother's womb, the more you engage those things in your life, the more you become a threat to the enemy. And here's the reality that you need to understand. God showed me this many years ago. I was just mind of my own day. And the Holy Spirit said, you know, God has, I have a plan for you. I said, yeah, yeah, Lord, I know that. And he says, well, do you know that the enemy also has a plan for you? And I said, yeah, I guess now that you mentioned, I guess I, I do know that. He says, then why don't you have a plan for you? And that stayed with me for, for years now. That has stayed with me, and I want it to stay with you. God has a plan for you. The enemy has a plan for you. Do you have a plan for you? You know, you hear the old adage. It's not really scripture, but it's true. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Don't make it your plan to fail. Don't make it your plan by default to just live this idle life and not pursue all the good things that God has in store for you. Don't live a life that immediately just defaults to surrendering to the enemy and letting him have his hand and his way in your life and in your calling. Don't give it over so easy. Okay. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, we see Jesus, the son of God. He is at the last supper. This is where he's with his disciples the night that he is gonna be uh, apprehended. He's gonna be taken into custody and then they're gonna execute him. Uh, over the next few days, he's going to give his life for you and I. So this is a very important night. And, you know, he's having a conversation with Peter. If you know Peter, Peter has an incredible story. He's been with him doing ministry for about three years now. And, um, and Jesus is kind of letting Peter in on a little secret that not long from that moment, Peter was going to deny him. He was going to fumble and fail in his faith. How many of y'all have ever fumbled or failed in your faith? I know I have. So he's trying to give Peter just a little bit of a heads up that he was about to fumble really hard, okay? But he was trying to encourage him at the same time. And look what this says in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And the Lord Jesus, he said, Simon, Simon. Now let's stop there just for one second because this is so interesting. What was he known by after, after Jesus changed his name? Not Simon, but what? Peter. But Peter. But in this moment, long after Jesus changed his name, how does he address him? 
He addresses him by the old man. Because so many times when we slip into the, our old ways, we slip into that old person and the Lord has to remind us, hey, that's not, that's, hey, you're acting like the old you. Right. That's not who you are. Remember? Remember, right. I, I died for that. Remember, you were crucified with me and you've been raised again with me and you're not living your right. old life. You're living by the faith that the son of man yeah. gave for you. And then you can live through me and in me. And this yeah. isn't you. This is the old you. Right. How many of you guys okay. have just had to say goodbye to the old you? Amen. On, amen. Aren't you glad you did? Aren't you glad you said bye to the old you? So he's calling him Simon, Simon. If you have your paper Bible, I want to encourage you, just cross out Simon and just put your name in its place. Because what I'm about to tell you is so real and it's so true, and I want this to just sit heavy in your heart. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, indeed, listen, Satan has asked for you. Now, if that doesn't creep you out, I don't know what will. Satan has asked for you. And this wasn't just for Peter. This is for you today. You need to know that Satan has asked for you. That he may sift you as wheat. That is the enemy's plan. That is what he wants to do in your life. He wants to sift you. He wants to grind you to a dust to where you are left to be nothing. He wants to wipe away your existence from this planet. He hates you and he hates God and he hates the calling of God on your life. But look what Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Aren't you glad that we serve a God that stands at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for you and I day and night as the enemy is making accusations and trying to convince God that we're not worthy of the grace of God, but then Jesus raises his hands and those nail-scarred hands are just living proof that we are saved by the almighty grace of God and covered by the blood of the lamb. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is our intercessor? And so I just want you to know today three major ways that the enemy will come at you. You need to understand this as a believer. We've been pastoring for uh, many years now and we have seen, this is really just our own observation, what we have seen over the years. These are the three most common ways that we have seen the enemy come against individuals. And the, the first way is that he attacks your mind. This is the most common way. We see the enemy attacking in the mind and in so many different ways. He brings, of course, the most obvious, he brings temptation. We talk a lot about that. He tries to get you to, to displease God through the things you say, do, and think. He also tries to instill within your heart fear. The second you get bad news, immediately that fear grips your heart and you begin role-playing out what it could be like and how it could end up and then fear grips you and here you are completely um, spiritually paralyzed. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you. But God says to have faith in him and to believe and trust in him that he's with you always. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. That's not what God says. The enemy brings doubt into our mind. He brings anxiety he brings depression. We're seeing more depression nowadays in the church than we've ever seen it before. Just more and more and more depression uh, just wreaking havoc in the mind of believers. Oppression, that's when, that, that's when you feel this dark, uh, just this, this, this darkness latching to your life and you feel this emptiness and you're asking God, Lord, where are you? I don't understand. I just feel such a heaviness and such a darkness all over me. I'm saved. I love the Lord. I know who he is. I have a relationship with him, but I'm just engulfed and I feel like I'm wrapped up in this darkness that won't go away. That is the oppression of the enemy, but he starts in our mind. Personal worth. Think about this. We see this a lot in student ministry as well. So many students question, questioning their value and their worth. And of course, it leads to suicidal thoughts. Many, about 20 years ago, the statistic was every six seconds, a student um, takes their life in suicide. Every six seconds. That was 20 years ago. I don't know what the statistic is now, but it has to be much, much worse. And we've seen in our own ministry just in the last five years an incredible rise in, in suicide. We've done way too many um, funerals that were a result of suicide than we care to even share with you. But I'm telling you, the enemy is on a rampage and he is attacking people in their mind. The second way that he uh, most commonly attacks is through marriage and family. And what he'll do is he'll bring dissension in relationships. He'll, he'll allow anger to weasel its way in. He'll let, and that anger turns to wrath and outbursts yeah. of rage, quarreling, adultery, jealousy, greed, drunkenness. How many of you guys have, have, uh, are, are living proof that drunkenness makes your marriage better? 
No, nobody. Okay, I tricked you. Some of y'all You're hands. Like, that was a trick. You're like, yeah. Wait a minute. No, no. Drunk. You you've never known any couple for their marriage to get better because uh, because of drunkenness. That's just absolutely retarded. It's stupid. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, it will destroy a marriage and it will destroy a family. And then of course disunity. He just brings it. He brings disunity right into the middle of a marriage and family. And then finally, your ministry. Now, a lot of you, when you hear the word ministry, I think you immediately check out because you think of ministry of doing what we're doing up here by, by sharing the gospel on a stage. Although that is ministry, that is, that is not uh, all ministry. There are many different shapes and sizes of ministry. And you need to know this before you leave this yes. place today. You are called into the ministry. That's right. Every That's right. single one of you are called to do something for God. You're not called to live this life for yourself and to build up a great fortune and pass it on down to your kids, although those are great things. And it's great if you do that. And God blesses that when you do it his way. But that's not why you are here. We've done, I mentioned funerals. We've done many funerals over the years. Over the last 20 years, we've done many, many funerals. And I've never, ever stood beside somebody in their final moments and they ever say to me, Pastor Brad, I just wish I would have made more money. Or Pastor Brad, I wish I just would have built a bigger, nicer house. Or Pastor Brad, I wish I just would have dri you know, drove a, a, a newer car. I've never, I've never ever heard anybody say, I wish I would have become president of my company. I've never heard anybody say that on their deathbed. But you know what is most important to people when they die? Being surrounded by family and friends and knowing that they are ready and right with God. That, that, is, that is exactly where people land and where they end up in their last final moments. They're getting right with God, most of them. And I, I'm, I'm telling you this because I want you to understand priority. You are called into ministry. And if you're not living your ministry, you're not living God's will. Right. I'm just telling you that. How many of you guys like puzzles? Okay, I think they're demonic, but you, <laughs> you can like them if you want. They're frustrating to They us. are frustrating. <laughs> I have no patience, and I feel like I don't have time for them. But my grandma used to love these thousand-piece puzzles. Who the heck came up with the idea of making a thousand-piece puzzle? The it pieces just, are so tiny, you'll lose them. It makes no sense. Anyway, some people like them. Obviously, more than half the room does, and the man clapping. Okay, so here's my point. Have you ever put a puzzle together... And it's missing a piece. Worst thing ever, right? Makes me just want to set it on fire and throw it in the trash. Like it should not, it shouldn't exist if it's not complete. That drives me crazy because I don't know about you, but I'm OCD for G-O-D. Like I want things to just be right in order and great and excellent and just as close to perfect as possible. And a puzzle with one piece missing just ain't going to cut it. But you know, that's what you are to the church if you don't fulfill your calling. Yeah. If the church is one big, beautiful puzzle set out on the table, everybody doing their calling, everybody living the, you know, according to the gifts and the talents and the time and the treasure that God has given them, just using those resources to build God's kingdom and make it better and bigger and to make Jesus famous. If you're not doing your part, you are that hole right there on the table. And when people walk by, it's like, oh my gosh, that is horrible. Like why? It makes no sense. I hope I'm getting the point across. You're called to serve the house of God and serve the kingdom of God. But the enemy will do everything within his power to keep you from stepping out in faith and doing that. And he'll try so hard to cause you to say in your mind, this is the number one excuse we hear people say, I'm just too busy, got too much going on. It would beg to ask the question, what are you busy doing that is so important that it is more important than living the whole reason, living the purpose why God placed you on this planet, which is to fulfill your calling. What on earth could be more important than what God has already said is most important, and that's you fulfilling your purpose on this planet. I know I'm preaching hard. Just pull your feet back. Come on. It's all right. It's because I love you. And here's another way that the enemy will hit you, is he will, like us, people like us that are just really, you know, zealous and passionate for God and for the kingdom of God and for the church. 
And he'll use what God says is good. And he'll distort it. He'll say to people like us, it's not good enough. Won't you work one more day? Because, you know, you're not getting enough done. All this isn't going to get done unless you just work more, work harder, do more. And if he can't get people like us, to, if he can't stop us, he pushes us and says more, 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 more. Until there was a point in our ministry not many years back where we literally found ourselves completely emotionally just and, and, and relationally exhausted and we just wanted to quit because the enemy just pushed us and pushed us and pushed us and pushed us. You know, it works both ways. But he doesn't care which way, uh, you know, he just wants it to work. What, whatever it is, he just wants to make sure that it's going to work. So he's going he's to also just convince you in your mind that you're not worthy of serving. So many people have told us over the years, man, I'm just, I, I've, I've done so many bad things and no way could God ever use me. Guys, that, that, that is the biggest lie from hell that you could ever entertain in your entire life. None of us are perfect. Do you not understand? We don't deserve to even be on this platform. Do you know that scripture says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before the Lord? None of us are righteous in our own merit and anything that we've ever done, but only because of the grace of Jesus Christ and because of his shed blood, because of his resurrection and dying for our sins, are we made worthy to share the gospel and, and fulfill the calling that he's, that he's given us in our lives. So don't let the enemy convince you that you're not worthy of doing ministry. Let me just give you a big news flash. You're gonna screw up. So here's my advice. When you fall on your face in your faith, this is going to blow your mind because it's deep. Get up. Right. Right. Yeah. Your toddlers, you know, your baby's trying to learn how to walk and falls down. You're like, but. <laughs> You ain't never going to walk. <laughs> Man, I tell you what. No, you pick him up right. and you dust off his knees. You're like, all right, come on, come on. You can do it. Do it again. <laughs> Try it again. You're going to mess up. Right, yeah. Don't let the enemy convince you that you need to stay down. That's when you fail is when you stay down. But you yeah. succeed when you get up and you say, God, forgive me. That was really stupid. And I'm not going to do that again right? Like a dog returns to its vomit. I'm not going to go back to that junk. I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk my life out for you. And I'm going to please you in everything I say to you and think the enemy is going to try to attack your ministry. He's going to try to convince you that you're not making a difference. Has he ever done that to you? Absolutely. And you know, the Bible makes it really clear that he's a liar and he's the father of all lies. The Bible says in John 8 and 44 that he was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character. He is a liar and the father of all lies. You've got to know that what is going in your mind, these thoughts that the enemy places there, what you have to learn to do is you've got to learn to line them up with the truth. And the truth is right here. It's God's word. So the fact is what the enemy, and we said this last week, what he's trying so hard to do is to keep you out of the word because this you do not know the truth from a lie. And so many people today are believing the lies. That's why there are so many people dealing with depression and oppression and suicidal thoughts and marriages that are breaking down and falling apart and ministries that are not being fulfilled because the enemy comes in. And guys, even just last week, okay, we launched this series and all hell broke loose all weekend, okay? Everything was going wrong, nothing going right. We step out here, I believe it was second service. I think if you were here, you got blessed with me making a fool out of myself as I threw my mic across the stage, okay? Never has that happened before. Here's what the enemy was doing, guys, all day that you didn't know what was happening in my head. From the get-go that morning, the enemy was telling me, nobody cares. You are wasting your time. Nothing you're going to say today is going to make any difference to, in anybody's life. You might as well just go home. Everything was going wrong. Then I toss my mic across the stage as I'm fumbling it like a football and I'm feeling like a fool. And then the rest of the time he's saying, see, you're so stupid. Like you should just give up and go home. Nobody cares. But can I tell you, we battle. That's what we learned to do. We battle. We battled at the end of the day, seven, no, 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 Sunday, Nine people gave their life to Jesus last Sunday morning and took Next Step Kids and walked out of here different than the way they came in. English and Spanish. Now listen, Wednesday, 
seven people, seven students gave their life to Jesus on Wednesday night here in this room. The enemy knows, guys. He knows. He doesn't, he can't see exactly what's happening, but he knows when something big is about to happen. And he tries to prevent us. He works so hard. We have to do battle to say, I'm not giving into that trash. I'm just not going to do it. I was telling first service, I was so frustrated when we walked out of here last Sunday morning, feeling like a failure. Even though we'd seen people give their lives to Christ, we still felt like failures. We left. I wasn't about to turn on the broadcast, okay? We normally critique ourselves. We tell our staff. We always inspect what we expect. We make things better. I did not want to look at it. I was like, no, it was horrible. Worship was bad. I threw my mic. It was terrible. We didn't say anything good, whatever. Monday morning, we're at the gym, and I'm running on the treadmill. And I just felt like God said, I'd read my word that morning, and he said, turn it on. I'm like, no. He's like, turn it on. I'm like, "Mm, I don't... I don't want to. Like, I know I made a fool of myself. Do I have to watch it? Do we have to replay it? So I push play and I'm running on the treadmill and I kid you not, immediately worship comes on and I felt God's presence in the gym and I'm running. It was some fast song. I don't even know what we did last week and I'm running and all of a sudden my hand goes up and I'm like, what in the world am I doing? I'm on the treadmill and I'm like, I'm not, you know, I was so overcome with God's presence that I'm sitting there in the gym and I'm like, I'm stretching now because, you know, that's embarrassing. It's kind of weird. And so I'm, we're not trying to be the weirdos. If you're, not, if you're not running with your arms up, just worshiping God, you're not working out right. That's, that's how you should do it. But here's the thing. Nobody knows what's in your ear, so they're not <laughs> hearing like, it, you know? Them, so I'm like, I'm a weirdo. But here's what I want you to understand from my stupid story is that everything the enemy was telling me all day long was a lie. It was a lie. God's presence was in the house. God's presence was captured on the broadcast. People gave their lives to Jesus. It was a lie. That's what we have to understand is you got to learn to decipher what is truth from the lies that he's planting in your mind. So today we're going to teach you how to overcome the enemy very easily. Okay. How many like it easy, right? Like overcoming for dummies. Like we could write a book. Okay. We're going to make it so Man, I think you just offended the entire congregation. And How many remember the yellow books like <laughs> something for dummies on every subject, right? That's Somebody how I made it got college. rich. Are you kidding me? Somebody got rich over that, okay? <laughs> go with me to the book of James. We're gonna go to James chapter four. In James chapter four, we begin to see a very easy formula. Easy to understand, not so easy to execute. But I'm gonna help you today to break it down, okay, to make it easier. So James is the brother of Jesus. He's the half brother of Jesus, and he writes these words in verse six. He says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, James is about to lay out a formula, but before he does, he wants to lay some groundwork. He wants you to understand how God works. So he says, God resists the proud. What is the proud? The proud is the person that is self-sufficient. It's the spirit of a person that says, I don't need anyone else's help. I don't need God. I can do this on my own. And that word resist, guys, is such a strong word. It literally means to stand against. So the person who says, I can do this thing that's called life on my own. I'll walk out my own purpose. I'll have my own plan. I don't want to align my life with God. I'm not submitting or surrendering to anyone or anything. It's my way or the highway. That type of person, that spirit, God stands against it. Okay? But then in contrast, he says, but he gives grace to the humble. What is grace? Favor, unmerited favor, blessing. Now, what we have to begin to understand is what's the humble then? Who's the humble person? It's the person who realizes I can't do this on my own and I don't want to do this on my own. I recognize there is a a creator over the universe. I was created. I'm a created being. I do not want to have my own plan. I don't know what the future holds. God does. So I humble myself under the hand of almighty God. I surrender my life and let him have control. He lays this groundwork. Now go to a verse that you've heard in your life probably before. It goes in verse seven like this. Therefore, Anytime you see the word therefore, you know you got to read the passages before it, okay? He says, therefore, having understood the groundwork I just laid and how God works, submit to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee. Clearly lays out the formula. 
So the first thing he says basically is this, get under God's authority. Get under God's authority. Guys, the formula is so simple, but we mess it up and here's why. We miss out on this first getting under God's authority and we just try to resist the enemy. Because we've heard in our mind, just resist the enemy, he will flee. He's not fleeing because of you. And he's not fleeing because of me. He is a fleeing because of the power of almighty God living on the inside of the submitted believer, the one who is subject to God's authority. And you know, we think to ourselves, yes, I've done that. I have asked Jesus into my heart. Well, let's go a little deeper into this word submit. Let me give you the definition. In the original language, this is what it means. To place oneself under the authority of another. Now listen, we do not like the word submit in this culture. We just don't like it. You're like, you're not telling me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it and how I want to do it. That's how we like to roll. Okay. Anybody ever had a kid like that? Okay. I was that kid. I raised a few of those kids. You're pointing at one another. They're like, "Mm mm-hmm. I remember when Brett and I got married and it's like, look, this is, I'm just going to lay it out real plain. Okay. I will about do anything if you ask, but if you tell me what to do, we're probably going to have problems. Okay. I mean, it is just human nature to be like, we don't like that word submit because we think that somebody is taking control over us, like that they're dominating. But guys, when you understand this word, it was a military word. When James used it, everybody understood it was a military word. That meant you voluntarily placed yourself under the authority of someone else. Now, If you served in the military or you have family members who did, you understand what that means because you went into a recruiter's office and you signed on the dotted line. I'm assuming it's a dotted line. You signed that you were going to come under the authority of someone else. It's the same thing spiritually. It is you saying, God, I understand that you are the creator of the universe. You have a plan and a purpose for my life and I come under your mission. I come under your authority, but here's what it also means. It means it's not just a word you say, but it's something you do every single day. It is taking the word of God and as you read it, applying it to your life and acting out of obedience. It's not cherry picking what we like and holding on to the promises of God, but without the obedience that comes with it. See, so many people, we want the promises, but we don't want what it takes to get the promises. But if we will simply submit ourselves to Almighty God to come under His mission, then He says the second part of the formula you can resist the enemy. What does it mean to resist? In the original language, the word resist simply meant this, to set oneself against, to stand or to withstand and oppose. Here's what I want you to understand. When you know who you are in Christ and you realize that it has nothing to do with your power, it has nothing to do with who you are, but who Christ is in you, you can stand against the enemy's temptations. You can, can't, you can stand against the enemy when he's coming, hurling those attacks in your mind. Here's what you need to understand, those of you who are competitive. This is a game. He knows where he ends up in the end. He knows the fight is fixed, but his job is to try to get you every day to make a choice that causes you to go a little farther away from your purpose and your calling. You see, the fact is when you resist the enemy, you get stronger. When you simply say, I will not give in. Brad told you last week that a psychologist told us years ago that most temptations, if you will withstand for six minutes, it's over. Six minutes, yet pornography is the number one addiction hurling all over the internet. It's like five billion or beyond, or beyond you know, industry that is destroying lives, not just men, but also women and families. It's one of the addictions. You know, the fact is the enemy simply wants you to think that you will never overcome. You will never overcome the addiction. You will never, ever, ever be able to break free. But guess what, guys? I told you all ago, he is a liar. He's a liar and the father of all life. If you will just resist, you get stronger. And the next time you resist, you get stronger again. And the next time you resist, you get stronger again. And yes, you're going to fall down. There's going to be a time where you fall down. But guess what? You don't stay down. 
You get your booty back up and you get back in the game. When a football player gets taken down, do they lay out there and go, oh, that hurt? No. What in the world? We would be like, get him off the field. He's embarrassing everybody. Don't be the believer laying down because you got your tail handed to you. Get your booty back up. That's why it's so important to get in a life group, get in a small group, get around people who can say, no, 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 get up. Yes, you fell. Get up up. We've all messed up. Get up. We're not perfect people, but guess what? We are going to give our very perfect effort as we progress in this thing called the Christian life. Can you give Jesus a hand? Now we know that this can be intimidating when you think about the reality that we as believers are in a spiritual battle. We know that that can seem overwhelming, but I want to encourage you as we conclude today's service. We all in this room have an incredible privilege that most people don't realize they have. And it's the ability to foretell our future. I, I love history. I love, you know, reading the stories of, you know, what it was like and, you know, different eras during the Civil War and um, the Revolutionary War and just different phases of American history. And even, of course, you know, the Word of God takes us all through uh, history from the beginning of mankind. Um, but it also fast forwards to the end of the book. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool privilege that you and I would be able to look and read how our story ended. Because John, the apostle John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos and God downloaded visions and showed him while on that island, how all this would end. And he wrote the book about the church and you can read about it in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And we can look back with him and we can read and we can see we're living and breathing now, but there will be a day when we are in glory with God. But this verse tells us how all of this battling and all this wrestling with, with, not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and forces of darkness of this unseen world, we get to see how all this ended. And it says this, this is what happened. And they, his church, that's you and I, they overcame him. But how did we overcome Satan? This is the end of our story. By the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. I want you to understand something today as we leave. It's not that we win. We do. But it's more that we have. You see, the victory has already been complete. It's already finished, and it happened way back at the cross of Calvary. That day when Jesus shed his blood for you and me is the day that we won. It's because of his shed blood being poured out. You and I, our sins are covered and taken away because of the blood of the lamb. And that blood provides protection for you and I. You know that there's nothing Satan or any of his demons can do to you or your life without the express permission of God because you are covered by the blood of the lamb. Do you understand that you are protected by the blood of the lamb only as a sealed believer in Jesus Christ. When you have a real life-changing relationship with him that is contagious, you're covered by the blood of the lamb and you are protected. But you also come under the authority of the word of your father in heaven because we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters of the most high God and he has provided for us the authority of his word. And Jesus said at the great commission, right before he left this earth, he said, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And do you understand that when we were grafted in as Gentiles into the vine, and we became a part of the family of God, that we became joint heirs with Jesus and we have the same authority through the word of God to speak his word and we can make demons tremble. We can drop atomic bombs into the pits of hell and make them go off because of the word of God in our lives. That's why we push so hard and so heavy for you to know 
God's word. You need to know when the enemy comes in your mind like a flood and he tells you all these things about you and your family and your calling that are not true. You need to reverse the curse. You need to set him straight. You need to tell him what the word of God says and you need to stand on the truth of his word and not let him get a foot in any day, any hour because he's going to come against you every single day of your life. We win. Give God praise today. We win. This is how all this ended. We overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Let's pray today. Father, God, I thank you for your word. God, I, I thank you for what you've done on the cross. God, I pray today, Lord, that you would help every person under the sound of my voice to understand that we are not victims, but we have the victory of Jesus Christ that was given to us at the cross. We can stand firm. We can resist and war with the enemy and be victorious every day of our lives until Jesus takes us home. God, I pray today that each of us would understand what this really means, the importance and the impact of what this means in our lives, God, as we serve you each and every day, as we strive to be holy, as we strive to remain under the authority of your word and your promises. God, help us, your people, to be holy. Help us to be set apart from anything that would displease you. Help us to be set apart from any hint of immorality that would be among us, that we would please you in everything that we say, do, and think. God, I love you. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that we have overcome. I thank you, God, that we can defend our faith today because of your promises, because of your word. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you know, the first step to overcoming the enemy is stepping out in faith and asking Jesus to live inside your heart. And you can do that by asking God to forgive you of your sins. You can do that by believing upon God's word that Jesus is the son of God and that it's only through him that we can be saved. You can do that by confessing Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. His word says that he is quick and just to forgive us of our sins. So won't you do that today? Won't you call out to God in your heart and say, Lord, I just want you to live inside of me. I surrender my life fully to you and your will. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're praying that prayer today, you're making that decision to make Christ your Lord, would you just raise your hand in this room? And we're gonna pray a prayer together as a church family. But if that's you, just raise your hand nice and high. Thank you, I see your hand in the back. I see your hands up in the risers, about three, four hands. Thank you. I see a hand on my right, two hands. Thank you. Six. Thank you. Praise God. Anybody else today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Anybody else? Praise God. Seven. I see your hand in the back. If you're watching on the broadcast, I want you just to jump in on the comments and I want you to say all in if you're giving your life to Jesus. And so right now we're going to pray this prayer with you as a support to you, celebrating you as you make the best decision you've ever made. And as you hear the voices praying this prayer with you, know that this is a picture of what the church of Jesus Christ is. We are the family of God. We don't leave our people alone or isolated or stranded. We stick together. We make each other better and better and better so we can live out our purpose and calling. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, forgive me of my sins. I ask that you would clean my slate and make me new. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the Son of God. I confess him today to be Lord of my life. Help me, God, to defend my faith by overcoming the enemy. Thank you, God, that I have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. In Jesus' name.